All right, welcome everyone again to our IAS Astrophysics Seminar. Today we are very happy to have one of our own, Horang Sheng Chia, who will talk to us about tidal deformation and dissipation of rotating black holes. Horang Sheng got his PhD at the University of Amsterdam uh, in 2020 and, and joined us here at IAS just this past fall. So we're very happy to have you here today to give the seminar and take it away. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, today I want to talk about work that was published last October. I actually briefly discussed this over both Bacall Lunch and Astro Coffee last semester, but now given this seminar, I have more time to sort of elaborate on this work. In particular, it's about how black holes, rotating black holes specifically, uh, or generically, if you like, uh, would respond when it is perturbed uh, by external tidal fields in general astrophysical environments. So that would be the main uh, story that I'd like to tell you today. There's actually a second part of the talk, which is not entirely unrelated with the first part, which is that it turns out you can use the distributive response of rotating black holes to probe a certain class of dark matter, which is commonly known as fuzzy dark matter, wave dark matter. Um, but again, uh, time permitting, I'll describe that. If not, we can talk about that over uh, discussion later at three o'clock, uh, if you're free to join. So before all of that, let me just give a sort of uh, quick uh, motivation for this talk, which is that I believe that we can all agree that we, we are living in a golden era of observation of black hole astronomy. I mean, in addition to the very beautiful pictures, uh, of M87, uh, which is published by the EHT collaboration that Leah has described to us uh, in the past. On the gravitational wave side, we are seeing many um, signals emitted by binary black holes. So to date, we have about 50 binary black holes that's confidently detected uh, by the LIGO and Virgo collaboration. So that's about 100 black holes. And this number will very rapidly increase over the next few years and certainly over the next few decades. Yeah. So we really are in an exciting time where we are observing populations of black holes that are previously uh, unobserved. Now, given the plurality of signals that we will observe, you can ask what type of physics they can learn about the nature of the binary components. Now, let's, let us take a step back and forget about black holes for the moment and just think about uh, a general astrophysical compact object, okay? And think of them as uh, being in a binary uh, in spiral. So what is the type of physical effects that would kick in, right? At leading order, you would say that you can model these compact objects as just point particles, all right? So they're quantified that it, by quantities like mass and spins. But if you want to probe the, the nature of these uh, objects, you would have to go beyond the point particle approximation and look at something that's commonly known as finite size effects. So how, uh, for example, the leading order would be how these objects will actually deform when they're perturbed by uh, a binary companion. So here I try to draw the, uh, the leading order quadrupolar deformation of such an object. So these are, this is the uh, classic tidal bulge. Um, uh, that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. So the tidal deformability of an object is quantified by something that's commonly known as Luff numbers. And the value of these Luff numbers depends sensitively on the internal structure of the object. Now, in addition to the tidal deformability, an object is characterized by its viscosity. And the viscosity tells us how much energy and angular momentum will be lost or transferred to this object. Uh, when it is interacting with its tidal environment. So of course, the famously, this uh, leads to a lot of interesting phenomena, such as uh, the tidal torquing or tidal acceleration in two-body problems. In the most familiar example, say in the Earth-Moon system, we know that this dissipative effect will lead to the very gradual spin down of Earth, of Earth and simultaneously a very gradual recession of Moon away from us. So both the tidal deformation and dissipation will leave very distinct imprints in the phase of gravitational waves emitted by binary systems. And in fact, we know very precisely how these effects affect the, uh, the phase of waveforms. For example, for tidal dissipation, we know that 
This effect first appears at 2.5 post Newtonian order in the phase of waveform. So this is V to the five suppressed compared to the, uh, the leading order Newtonian uh, phase contribution. On the other hand, we also know again very precisely how these love numbers appear at the phase of waveforms at five post Newtonian order. So V to the 10 suppressed compared to the leading order contribution. And so a precise measure of these phase imprints would allow us to probe the nature of these binary constituents in addition to measurements of mass and spins of these systems. So you can ask, you know, what type of physics, you know, realistically can I learn about uh, through these uh, tidal measurements? Now, Caroline have told us a few weeks ago that for binary neutron stars, you can measure these love numbers of neutron stars and probe indirectly the nuclear equation of state uh, at the center that describes the center of these high density um, neutron stars. Or indirectly, this would be probing quantum chromodynamics in the sort of uh, low temperature and high density regime. On the more speculative note, um, measurements of these tidal effects could provide hints for the existence of new types of dark objects that are simply uh, cannot be observed through other observation means, for example, if these objects do not emit light. So there are actually no short of examples what these types of uh, speculative dark objects uh, could be. If you look at the particle physics literature or the phenomenology literature, uh, there are various proposals for, for, um, for this effects. And so if these objects are in binary systems, they could uh, leave very important imprints in the phase of the, uh, of the gravity wave emission. Now, coming back to black holes, we know that black holes are fascinating objects, but at the same time, in some sense, they're also the simplest object by virtue of the no hair theorem. So they're only described essentially by the mass and spin and charge, and the rest of the properties of the black holes are uniquely described just by these uh, three free parameters. On top of that, binary black holes are the most abundant sources of gravitation waves that we detected in the LIGO and Virgo detectors. And so I would argue that a precise understanding of the tidal effects of black holes are not only of direct importance in astrophysics, but it could also shed light on fundamental nature of gravity, um, which would be, would have, uh, could have profound implication for for uh, fundamental physics. So the upshot of this talk is that um, there have been recent progress in showing that black holes do not uh, deform when they're perturbed by a static external tidal field. So the catchphrase here, the catchphrase is that black holes do not fall in love. So a standard star would have sort of this tidal bulging, but in the case for a black hole, uh, it would not have these, these type of deformation. So this fact has actually been known for quite some time for Schwarzschild black holes. The recent progress has mostly been made because uh, we've extended the results to uh, for an object spinning black hole. So that is the, the deformation part of the response. In terms of black hole dissipation, uh, in general, energy and angular momentum will be absorbed into the black hole. So this is the standard intuition that you may have that- Can, can I ask so in, can I ask a question about just the meaning on the previous slide? So, in, so, the, so this means in the case of the spinning black hole, that the shape of the yeah. event horizon is the same as it would be if the spinning black hole were isolated. Exactly. So a spinning black hole will have some deformation, but that deformation is spin induced, right? You right. have this bulging that uh, the layer described uh, in in astral coffee. This is a statement that there will be no induced uh, response. There will be no induced changes okay. of of the shape of a rotating black hole when it's perturbed by external tidal field, right? And specifically, the shape yeah, of so its clarification. Right. Right. Thank you. So with, for dissipation, um, again, you would have this classic sort of intuitive, uh, the intuition that uh, because of the one-way membrane nature of the event horizon, energy and angular momentum will be absorbed into the black hole. So this is obviously uh, widely known. But interestingly, for highly rotating black holes, the dissipative response 
could actually amplify modes that is incident on these rotating black holes and what is commonly known as a black hole superradiance phenomenon. So superradiance is actually uh, well known, in fact, since the 70s. Um, I think in the context of astrophysics, it is most well known in the context of, um, of this blanford uh process in which um, you can have these uh, emission of high energy jets uh, from highly spinning black holes uh, due to accretion of matter onto, onto these black holes. So this is sort of the second part of the talk that I want to discuss again, time permitting, which is that using the dissipative response of black holes, using black hole superradiance, you can actually do some physics beyond the standard model. In particular, it turns out that uh, if you have massive boson fuse uh, in nature, such as you know, wave dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, uh, superradiance can uh, trigger an instability of these rotating black holes and form a cloud of boson condensate around the black hole. And so these, uh, the phenomenology of these uh, objects are very interesting and could shed light on, on the nature of dark matter. Now, quite interestingly, it turns out the structure of these objects is directly analogous to the proton electron structure of the hydrogen atom, and therefore they're often called the gravitational atom. So usually when we think about fuzzy dark matter, we're talking about mass ranges of wave, uh, wave dark matter in the range from 10 to minus uh, 22 or, or, or lighter. And the reason for that is because most of the constraints that we can place on fuzzy dark matter uh, is placed by the CND or from uh, Lyman Alpha Forest, okay. But those both are very large scales, uh, cosmological and galactic scales. And so those constraints would really only apply to these coherent waves uh, whose quantum wavelength are precisely of those cosmological and astrophysical scales. Now for black hole superradiance, it turns out these clouds would grow most efficiently when the quantum wavelength of the boson view is roughly of the size of a rotating black hole. So suppose that the mass function of astrophysical black holes uh, has ranged from about three solar mass to 10 to the 10 solar masses, that match condition that I described earlier would translate into probing wave dark matter in the range from 10 to minus 10 to 10 to minus 20 electron volts. So this would be sort of a complementary probe to what uh, the CMB or from what the Lyman Alpha Force measurements uh, could allow us um, to probe. Okay, so that's a relatively long introduction, but I hope it gives a good sense of where I'm trying to head into uh, in the rest of the talk. So I divide the rest of my talk into three parts. The first two for the tidal response of black holes, and then the third part for these probes of wave dark matter. So I know that we have many experts on tidal interactions in the audience, but I think it's to understand these deformation and dissipation responses, it's instructive to take a step back and go back to electromagnetism because it turns out that the, the tidal deformation and dissipation are really just gravitational analogs of susceptibilities in ENM that we all learned in our undergraduate uh, uh, courses. Then I'll talk about the responses in Newtonian gravity, and then I'll need to briefly describe black hole perturbation theory in order to talk about the tidal responses of black holes in GR. Okay, any questions before I move on to the first part of the talk? Uh, this is uh, just to say that you can basically classify these two parts of the talk as, in one case, perturbations of black holes by a massless field, and the third part, a perturbations by massive fields. Uh, dark matter must have masses, as we all know. Okay, um, if there are no questions, let me briefly talk about susceptibilities in ENM. So, in, in electromagnetism, you have a blob of material. And imagine apply uh, an external electric field on this blob of material. And what would happen? Now, the, the dipole moments of this material will reorganize itself and acquire a polarized, an induced polarization that I call P here. So the, the linear relationship between the induced polarization and the external tidal field is quantified by uh, this uh, susceptibility constant. So this quantifies the linear response 
of this polarization. So if you apply E, what you ultimately measure is a sum of E and P. One interesting fact is that in this case, where I have a permanent external electric field, um, the material will polarize instantaneously because there's no time scale in the problem. But in general, the external uh, electric field can vary with time and the material in this case would not polarize instantaneously. In the limit where the external electric field is slowly varying with time, I'm sorry, before that, uh, in general, the response, the induced polarizability is given by the convolution of this uh, susceptibility quantity with the external electric field. In the limit where the external electric field is very slowly varying with time, you can do a expansion in time scales and find that again, at leading order, you just have the static uh, induced polarization term. But leading all the time derivative, you find there's an E dot term here. So it tells you how, how fast the uh, external electric field changes. And the proportionality constant is quantified by something that's often known as the dissipation number or so. And one easy way of seeing that this is dissipation, this, this describes dissipation in the material, is that this is a single, uh, this is all powers in time derivatives. And in other words, it is not uh, invariant under time, re time reversal. And so it actually does not conserve energy. Can I ask you, so why does chi E depend on tau? It's, it, isn't it just a property of, isn't the susceptibility a property of the material that doesn't? Right, right. Here it depends on, here it depends only on the property of the material. Here I've decomposed into two part, one which tells me the typical delay time scale associated to these uh, dynamical response. Uh -huh. And of course, another term that also describes the, uh, the property of the, of the material itself. Okay, but, but that, chi E1 and chi E0 are not the same thing. They're actually, ultimately, you can, you can boil them down into the same unified expression, but in the, in the expansion, uh, typically they're, they're different. When you do an expansion of this form, they're typically different by all the one coefficients. Uh, okay. But yeah, essentially they, they trace back to the fundamental uh, property of the material itself. And they are not independent. So that was the uh, relation in the time domain. So, and we know that a convolution in the time domain corresponds to just a product of quantities in the frequency domain. And so in Fourier space, we just have this simple relation between P and E, where omega now is the frequency of the external electric field and the susceptibility quantity uh, has this form. So the I, the I here, it just comes from Fourier transforming the single time derivative. Now, a key takeaway message from this slide is that the conservative part of the response is quantified by the real part of chi, and the imaginary part of this response quantifies the dissipative response of, uh, of the material, precisely because of the odd powers, the odd power counting that I described earlier, corresponding to a non, you don't preserve time reversal invariance, and therefore energy is not conserved by virtue of this operator. Okay, so that was all for E and M. You can directly draw direct analogies between E and M and Newtonian gravity, which is that now you have a star with quadruple moments Q and the external uh, tide of uh, is described by this, uh, by this E quantities here. And I'm careful in choosing the notation that this is delta Q instead of Q because this is precisely what David was asking just now, this is actually the induced response, the change into the quadruple moments or the multiple moments of the star due to the presence of the external tidal view. And the linear relationship uh, between these two quantities is quantified by the Luft numbers that are called K here. And this is essentially how Luft numbers are defined. Just for clarity, I just wanna say that L and M here are the uh, angular momentum numbers of the multiple expansion. Now, again, that was for a static external uh, tidal field. Sorry, I keep uh, confusing myself. Electric field and tidal field. But uh, now, when you have a time-dependent external tidal field, 
say you have a, uh, an object in a binary uh, in spiral. In this case, the external uh, time difference is not static, but it has a time, a time scale associated to it. And similarly to, to the ENM case, you can do a slow expansion time scale and find that, again, in addition to static tides, you would also have a dynamical tides. And this E dot term here correspond to the distributive response of, um, uh, of the object, where I call new here the dissipation numbers associated to the object's viscosity. So this is, of course, the classic story that in addition to having a bulge, viscosity would induce a time sort of phase uh, lag or phase advance uh, due, to this, uh, uh, due to this type of uh, dissipation effects. Again, that was the relation in the time domain. If you look at the frequency domain, you get this, this linear relationship where F is this quantity that, uh, that characterizes the total response of this Newtonian object. And similarly to the NM case, the real part of the response quantifies the deformation, the conservative change in the shape of the star. And the imaginary part of the response quantifies dissipation. This is exactly analogous to what we saw earlier uh, for the material in electromagnetism. So that was the tidal response, strictly speaking, for, for a non-rotating body. You can ask what happens when you have rotation now. Now, the, the story is actually similar when you have a rotating body. You will still have a general expression like this, except that uh, when you have rotation, there's actually an ambiguity of which frame you're actually quantifying this response. You can either work with the, the observer's frame where you see the object spinning, or you can also work in the co-rotating frame in which you see the object basically not rotating. I mean, these are, this is a choice of frame of reference that you can make here. Um, but ultimately, uh, essentially the, the functional form of the response uh, is the same, uh, regardless of choices of references. The only difference uh, of the reference frame is in how the frequencies, the perceived frequency would be. Imagine now you have a rotating body, right? If you go to the co-moving frame, sorry, let me take a step back. If you have a rotating body, but the, but the static external tidal field, and then if you go to the co-rotating frame of the body, you would, you would perceive the static external tidal field as if the tidal field is actually rotating at a frequency that's proportional to the spin uh, of this object. Okay. So there's a, uh, there's a relative change in the perceived frequency between the co-rotating frame and the inertial frame. What this means is that in the presence of a strict static external tidal field, the relative motion of, the of a spinning body and the external view translates into the fact that you can still have dissipation uh, in this uh, for, a, uh, for a rotating body in a static external view. So the, because of uh, the presence of these perturbations, the total potential, the, the, the Newtonian potential of this perturb, uh, body would have this form. The important takeaway message here is that um, there's a term here that depends on the external uh, tidal view, which scales like R to the L, scales as some positive power of L. And this term is essentially, uh, it receives these contributions from the external potential sourced by the binary companion. And on top of that, there's a term here that decays. So if you look at the scaling here, this is R to the L but it has a one over R to the two L plus one term here. This is the so-called decaying terms and the coefficient of this decaying term uh, describes the response of the object and the response of the object itself, will, of course, uh, provide contributions to the, uh, to the Newtonian potential. Are there any questions uh, before I move on to uh, talking about black hole perturbation theory? Next slide. Okay, if not, uh, I just want to say that in, in GR, in addition to these so-called electric type tides, there are also magnetic type tides, yeah? 
which are sourced by motion of, ha, of uh, relativistically moving objects. So in addition to E, there is a B that uh, they're used to denote the magnetic type tides. And these are exactly analogous to the magnetic susceptibilities uh, in electromagnetism. So there's almost a one-to-one -one analogy between, uh, between E and M and gravity. Okay, um, so this is a slide onwards where I talk very briefly about black hole perturbation theory. So, so Einstein's view, uh, Einstein's field equation is very complicated to solve. It, in general, it's a PDE, right? Uh, but for various practical reasons, it turns out that it's convenient to decompose the wild tensor of GR into five complex scalar fields uh, in what is called the uh, newman penrose formalism of GR. So these five complex fields are often denoted by psi zero to psi four. I'm not going to go into details of all of this, I just want to mention a few key reasons why we want to work with these wild scalars. First of all, there's a so-called Peeling theorem that describes how these wild scalars will actually decay at large distances. Um, so if you look at this scaling here, our psi four would be the quantity that dominates the gravitational field at asymptotic infinity. In fact, psi four is directly related to the two polarizations of gravitational waves. Uh, in this relationship. So for example, when Elias uh, does a numerical relativity simulations, uh, he would be extracting the gravitational waves emitted by, by those systems, essentially by measuring psi four at the boundary of the simulation boxes. Okay? So psi four really is a, a key quantity uh, that is often uh, used in, in, the, in the GR literature. Now, analytically, psi is also interesting because of the Tchaikovsky equation. So for those who do not know what the Tchaikovsky equation is, the Tchaikovsky equation essentially is an ordinary differential equation that describes the perturbations of psi four and psi zero, where the background space-time is a curved black hole. Okay, again, in general, Einstein's equation is a complicated set of PDE. The power of the Tchaikovsky equation is that it it decouples all of this uh, PDEs into a set of coupled ODEs. So ordinary differential equations are much easier uh, to solve than partial differential equations. And this is why a lot of progress in black hole perturbation theory uh, has been possible over the last few decades because of the discovery of this Tchaikovsky equation. Just to make things a little bit more precise, the psi four quantity, uh, can be separated through this ansatz where you decompose all of the four uh, space-time coordinates, uh, the functional form of the four space-time coordinates uh, into this form. So this is V is just a time component, uh, phi is the, is the mutual angle component, and these uh, plane wave behavior just arises from the, um, the isometries of, of the curved black, uh, the curved background space-time. Nice thing is that you can actually separate the radial part and the angular part uh, in the Tchaikovsky formalism, and therefore uh, just solve the equations as a couple set of ODEs and R and the data. Now, one of the things that's uh, often not talked about uh, when people talk about black hole perturbation theory is that there's some overall constant here uh, in, in the separable ansatz. For all purposes, the reason that this constant is important is because if you look at the real part of this constant, you see that it is proportional to the electric type tidal fields um, that I discussed earlier. And the imaginary part of this constant is proportional to the magnetic type tidal fields. And this is just to say that all of the information about the external tidal field, the E and the B parts are all absorbed into this mode decomposition of psi four. And so psi four really sort of fully describes the, the perturbation that's sourced by a general uh, tidal field on, on a curved black hole. This is just showing you uh, one representation of the radio equation, the radio Tchaikovsky equation. I'm not going to go into the details of this, 
of course, except I just want to say that there's a, a term uh, in the ODE which dominates when R approaches the outer horizon of the black hole R plus. And because this is a term that dominates near the event horizon, this coefficient P plus here is is this quantity that essentially captures all of the physics associated to the event horizon. And this factor is often known as the superradiance factor. It has this very complicated form, but it's just proportional to this, uh, this frame dragging effect, if you like, that described uh, for the rotating Newtonian body. And this P plus here, we actually keep crop up uh, in the rest of my talk, so I want to emphasize this point, and it is in very directly related to uh, the story of the gravitational atom that I will tell you later. So that was all about part one. Any questions before I move on to part two? I, I have a question about super radiance. So in, in the mm -hmm. Blanford's Nike example you gave, there ultimately the um, the energy is coming out of the spin of the black hole. Is that always true in, in, in all the different forms of super radiance? Is it extracting yes. energy from spin of the black hole and then yes. radiating yes. it away? Okay. Essentially, yes. So, so there's different ways of doing the extraction, but they're all right. You can either ex converting spin energy into radiation. Right. It could be radiation. Uh, specifically an uh, electromagnetic field. It could also be a gravitational field yeah. or even a massive uh, field, yeah. Okay. Essentially just boils down to extracting energy and angular momentum from the spin of a curved black hole. Okay, if there's no more question, uh, let me move on. So I hope that I've motivated uh, the importance of the psi four quantity because it, um, it's a very convenient quantity to work with, especially in the context of black hole perturbation theory. And because of its importance, it's instructive to compute psi four for a general spherical star. And by spherical star, I mean more precisely a Schwarzschild space time. So there's a theorem that's called Birkhoff's theorem, which says that the, the space time metric of a spherical symmetric object. Uh, is always described by the Schwarzschild space time, uh, by the Schwarzschild solution. And this doesn't just apply to a Schwarzschild black hole, but, uh, but for any spherically symmetric star. And so here I've, I've shown you the, the results of psi four for such a space time. And you see that it's directly analogous to the expression for the Newtonian potential that I showed you early on. Particularly, there's a, there's a so-called growing term here that corresponds to the applied external tidal field, and there's a decaying term here that describes the response uh, of the object. And this constant here, just to emphasize, corresponds to the external electric type types and the magnetic type types uh, for the imaginary component. So how do we determine the left numbers of a general star? The way it works is that you, choose, set the surface of the star to some distance at R naught, and then you impose the boundary condition at the surface of the star. And then if you compute, um, sorry, and on top of that, for a general star, you would have to specify the nuclear equation of state or the microphysical properties of the star to set uh, that particular boundary condition. And once you uh, input all of those ingredients, uh, you would be able to determine uh, the coefficient at k uh, through these calculations. And for a general star, of course, the key uh, message is that the left numbers are non-vanishing. Uh, as Caroline described as for neutron stars, k is of the order of, I believe, a few hundred. Um, and a few hundred is a very relatively large number. And this is why they can be measured in gravitational wave astronomy even though these left numbers are 5 p.m. d to the 10 suppressed effect. So how does it work for a Schwarzschild black hole? The way it works is that we know that the horizon of the Schwarzschild black hole is located at 2 m. And on top of that, the boundary condition is this 
so-called only ingoing boundary condition at the event horizon. Now, if you impose these boundary conditions, uh, you would find that uh, the decaying term here, this DL factor here, actually diverges logarithmically. Uh, whereas the only ingoing boundary condition, this R term here, sorry, this GL factor here actually satisfies the only ingoing boundary condition behavior at the event horizon. And so because of this boundary condition, you would have to conclude that the decaying terms here must vanish identically. And that is only possible if the love numbers of Schwarzschild black holes are zero. So K has to be zero for all values of L and M here. So this is the, the classic proof um, about 10 years ago of why love numbers of, of Schwarzschild black holes have to be zero. So that was, uh, strictly speaking, the solution in the static limit where I've taken omega, the frequency of the external tidal field to be zero. But you can compute uh, finite omega corrections uh, to psi four through the Tchaikovsky equation for the black hole. And in that case, if you compare the solutions of psi four in the static and the, uh, and the adiabatic limit, you'd find that the difference between the two solutions is a, uh, the appearance of a factor that I call P plus tilde, which is just a zero spin limit of the superradiance factor earlier on. And similarly, if you look at the coefficient of the decaying term of this uh, Schwarzschild black hole psi four, you can extract the tidal response and out comes uh, the final result of the Schwarzschild response of the curved black hole in the in a dynamical uh, uh, external tidal field. So just to emphasize here that the real part of this response function is zero. And so that the love numbers of Schwarzschild black holes vanish identically. And then the imaginary part, the leading or the imaginary part of the response has this term here. Uh, and these coefficients new describe the dissipation numbers of of Schwarzschild black holes. So this result has, is actually known for, for the dominant field else, L equals to two or L equals to three in the past. But here uh, you can derive a general uh, expression for nu that's valid for all values of L and M. Uh, and that is precisely the power of the Tchaikovsky equation. This is just a slide, uh, hopefully to make clear and juxtapose the tidal response of a general non-rotating body in Newtonian gravity in the response of a Schwarzschild black hole. So here you see that the left numbers of a Schwarzschild black hole is zero. And the, the dissipative response is, you know, these two terms are exactly analogous to one, to one another. Where in the case of a Schwarzschild black hole, this typical time scale here is given precisely by the black hole light crossing time, uh, 2m. And the dissipation numbers are of just some dimensionless coefficients. Now, one interesting fact about Schwarzschild black holes is that in the strict static limit, the tidal uh, response actually vanishes identically. So omega is zero. If you compute the high order corrections to these terms here, they all, they all have to depend on omega. Uh, so when omega is set to zero in the strict static limit, a Schwarzschild black hole would not respond. Uh, at all, okay. we just stay as the spherical, uh, a spherical solution. And this is of course not the case for a curved black hole because in the case for a curved black hole, in addition to omega, I have a new time scale, which is the spin of the black hole. And therefore, even in the case where you have a strictly static external tidal field, uh, the spin of the black hole can generate a non-vanishing response uh, for the curved black hole. Are there any questions for the source here before I move on to curve? Yes, I want to understand how. So, if I think about a you know, a, a massive, a, a supermassive uh, Schwarzschild black hole, and then an, an orbiting lower mass right. uh, Schwarzschild black hole, yeah, is in that case, is the tidal field. Is that a static tidal field? Uh, 
or or because because it's changing in the in the rotating frame is that a dynamic title view yeah good so, so uh in the case of a swirl show, by definition, uh, there's no there's no difference between there's no co-rotating frame uh, in that case. So, but you can but it's a good question to ask whether when you have uh, an orbit an, an orbit, the tidal field is not strictly static, right? It is adiabatic. There's still a very slow time scale associated to it. So you're right. So in that so the statement of lift numbers being zero is strictly in the static limit. Uh, but it is a very good approximation when the external tidal field is slowly varying with time, such a leading order, you can approximate that tidal field to be to be static. Um, so, so the orange thing is it is it the same as in the as in the binary neutron star case where people have shown that the dynamic tides are just subleading? It is when yeah. They, when they actually look at this, right? Ultimately, the comparison is is this quantity, the frequency of the perturbation to the typical mm -hmm. delay time scale. Right? And if this dimensionless quantity is small, which in the case for gravity wave astronomy, they're always small, mm -hmm. um, they're always unimportant. Yeah, so, so for all practical purposes, you can only care about the uh, static tides. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, let me quickly move on to curl black holes. Well, in this case, if you look at the solution for psi four, for Kerr, it is essentially say, the same as the solution for the Schwarzschild black hole that I showed you earlier, except that the superradiance factor is this, you know, is in its full glory. Okay, uh, where p plus is not the spin is not the zero spin limit, but a the spin of the black hole can be uh, any value here. And it's easy to check that this solution just re just reproduces the, uh, the Schwarzschild solution when you take the spin of the black hole A to zero. And you repeat the same exercise that I showed you earlier on, you'd find that this, this response function of the curved black hole uh, has this form. Again, the real part of the response is zero identically, and so curved black holes do not fall in love. If you look at the dissipative response of a black hole, you find that it has this factor, which precisely describes this relationship between co-rotating frame or the inertial frame that I, that I uh, briefly mentioned earlier on. And this is exactly what the superradiance factor is. Now the key takeaway message here is that the superradiance factor can either be positive or negative depending on the angular frequency of the black hole horizon. Okay. When the angular frequency is large, this term is positive and this is actually this corresponds to the case where dissipation means that you have mode amplification. Or in other words, um, you can extract energy and angular momentum from a highly rotating black hole. On the other hand, when the black hole spin is small, this term would become negative. And this goes back to the usual case where you actually lose energy and angular momentum into the black hole event horizon. So Horn Chang, is that is that in principle similar to the CFS instability for like a rotating fluid body? Yeah, you have something similar there. Actually, the expressions look look very look very much the same. Where depending on basically the observer frame, you could have like a gravitational wave perturbation traveling um, against the the rotation of the of the fluid body, but then it looks like it's traveling in the same direction for the for the observer outside, and that does something very similar. Um, yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm not familiar with that related. at all. Hmm? I'm not familiar with uh, with that particular instability, but it sounds. Uh, that, sounds that's a that's a Chandrasekhar uh, Friedman Schutz instability. But we, we can we can talk later. We can we can talk later in the uh, in the discussion session. But thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, but I think this is a very generic phenomenon because it's actually in some sense purely kinematic. Um, the nature of the event horizon is only important because the event horizon is a is a perfect absorber, right? It provides a perfect mechanism for dissipation. But I can definitely uh, easily imagine that uh, this phenomenon would generally happen for other types of stars or compact objects if there is an efficient source of an efficient mechanism for dissipation. So again, uh, this is a slide uh, just to juxtapose the response for a Schwarzschild black hole 
In the curved black hole, where you find that they're exactly analogous to one another. In fact, this expression would just go back to the Schwarzschild when the spin of the black hole is taken to be zero. Okay. But um, as I uh, emphasized earlier, what's different about the curved black hole is that in the limit where the external tidal field is zero, when omega is set to zero, the imaginary part of the response does not vanish precisely because of frame dragging, right? This is again back to the story that you have a rotating, uh, you have a rotating black hole and a static external field. Uh, dissipation can still happen because there's a relative motion between the spin motion of the black hole and the static external uh, tidal field. So curved black holes can still uh, dissipate. Um, can still respond to static tides uh, through, through this uh, dissipation. Let's see. Right, in the interest of time, maybe I won't have time to talk about uh, black hole superradiance and its uh, connection to fuzzy dark matter. So this would be the last slide, uh, where I just want to show, again, emphasize, that we know very precisely how tidal dissipation and these love numbers uh, affect the phase of the waveform. The superradiance factor is also interesting because it is a well-known uh, fact in the gravitational wave literature in that depending on the spin of the black hole, this tidal dissipation either appears at 2.5 post-Newtonian order or at four or at four PN order for a Schwarzschild black hole. And all of these can be ultimately explained by the superradiance factor here. Because in the post-Newtonian expansion, this frequency here actually scales as V to the Q. Okay, so there's a 1.5 relative uh, difference between tidal dissipation of curved black holes and of Schwarzschild black holes. All of this can be explained very nicely in this uh, superradiance factor here. So I think that's it, because uh, I don't think I have enough time to discuss the um, Part three of this talk. Um, yeah, I think I'll I think I'll stop there. I think uh, in the interest of time. So thank you, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we can open it up to questions. And yeah, a reminder that we can also continue this discussion today at three p.m. at the same Zoom link. Roman. Uh, Korshen, uh in all these uh, developments, uh, are you making an approximation that uh, the time scale? of the variability of the external field is much longer than a light crossing time of the black hole horizon. Is this uh, yes. the slowness of this the time? Is, yeah, so this is uh, exactly, uh, that is precisely that small dimensionless number yeah. is the reason why we can do uh, perturbation. Yeah. And presumably this is also the reason why you can neglect uh, dynamical tides because you know one distinction that you mentioned is uh, you're al always talking about sort of a static tide uh, which would be equivalent to, you know, the tidal bulge, the classical picture of the tidal bulge, phase lag, and so on and so forth. Whereas obviously there are modes on uh, the black hole uh, surface, which, you know, like when, when the black holes merge, there is this, you know, ringing down and so on. Indeed. So if, uh, for example, you have an uh, external perturber that's passing on an eccentric orbit very close to the black hole, that would generate a whole spectrum of the Fourier mode, some of which will have high frequencies. And presumably in that case, uh, you know, that uh, quasi-static limit will be violated. Right. So I guess my question is, uh, my question is, uh, well, uh, at w I mean, you, in your formula, you had all this, you know, uh, leading water, then imaginary term, then plus and the multiple dots. So this would be coming at, you know, some higher order. Uh, at high uh, orders in this, uh, on this dimensionless ratio, which is, the times yeah. the light crossing time towards the uh, the time variation of the external tide field. That's right. Those will come at how, those high orders. So how I mean, yeah. Have Have you looked into these high orders and you know how quickly, uh, how rapidly they uh, converge in principle? I mean, because at some point, obviously, you know, there would be an effect, and uh, I don't know if you would be like if you go to next order that you are not showing that. I mean, if it's a real, if it provides yeah. a real. Could that be interpreted as uh, some non-zero contribution to the loft number, for example? Right. So uh, two comments on that. First of all, for in gravitational wave astronomy, for all practical purposes, those dynamical tides for black holes, for neutron stars, uh, are actually essentially negligible, precisely because 
the typical uh, time scale of the star uh, is much is uh, is much faster compared to the orbital time scale uh, before they even merge. Okay, so so that's one thing. But you're right that for in the most general case, if you relax that assumption, I don't think we actually know how the dynamical love numbers uh, look like. I think we can be relatively confident that for a Schwarzschild black hole, where the only time scale is the is omega, the frequency of the external tidal field, um, those in fact have been computed, but only also just perturbatively. It doesn't take into account those resonant uh, phenomenon that you have described earlier. So I think that'll be interesting to explore uh, in more detail because uh, I don't think we know really in the literature at the moment. But you're saying at least for the short child black hole, these higher order terms have been uh, computed. Right, the they have been computed. Like, you know, these omega squared, omega cubed, and so on and so forth. Right, that right. There will be omega squared terms, uh, which are uh -huh. non-vanishing. There's a, in fact, uh -huh. uh, just a few months ago, there's a paper on that. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. That sounds interesting. Thanks. Maybe an, maybe an additional comment to that is that um, in terms of ringing, in terms of these dynamical responses to external tides, in some sense we know what happens there because that's precisely the type of ring down that you observe in the in the post merger phase of binary black yeah, holes. Right. Right, so that's the, the so-called quasi-normal modes of, of, a, of a black hole. So I think those are essentially, they essentially related to the dynamical tides of black holes that-, that uh, That's right, you just need about. a way to excite them. You need to have some perturbation with a frequency right. that's close to this frequency of quasi-normal modes so that right. you can get an excitation and uh, some right. action related to this. Right. That, 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 I mean, the, the description, I mean, description of the dynamical tides in normal stars is very different from the description of uh, the equilibrium tide. Uh, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, it's a wave of phenomenon. Uh, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. presumably the same would uh, be happening also in GR uh, in, the, in, you know, in the case that you're describing. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. The emphasis, of course, uh, at least in the context of gravity and astronomy is that because those dynamical tides would never be excited, uh, even at merger, I mean, sorry, even especially before merger, but at merger, you would export, you would excite these quasi normal modes, right? But before merger, in the inspire stage, you would never approach these time scales where dynamical types are yeah, significantly the, important. The so frequencies, are, frequencies are off. I guess what I'm just wondering is what, what the woman said with the, with the um, eccentric encounter, because I mean, for neutron stars, people mm, have thought mm, about this. If yes. they, they really have like this, this, this very, very close flyby, you could in principle, yes. like, like get, get uh, trigger, trigger some oscillation there. I wonder if for the black hole, you can get close enough because the black hole is much more compact if you actually manage to, to excite that. Yeah, in, excent in eccentric passages, so you, I mean, like mm -hmm. imagine like a parabolic passage of another black mm -hmm. hole pretty close to the, you know, the initial black hole, then you would get a full Fourier spectrum of uh, um, yeah. full Fourier spectrum. And, the, you know, some frequencies might actually get close and match uh, the frequencies of quasi-normal modes. I mean, this is what we, what we, what we observe in, uh, for example, uh, in stars. I mean, when there mm -hmm. are binaries, highly eccentric binaries, and when one uh, uh, of the stars is passing through the perihelion, it does excite uh, the mode mm -hmm. because, uh, the, you know, there are contributions in a, this you know expansion of the eccentric orbit that give you high frequencies that couple to the frequencies uh, present in a star, right? So that's what can happen yeah. as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think at the end of the day, those dynamical tides associated to black holes would be ultimately traced back to quasi-normal modes because essentially that's yeah, a no, quasi-normal. No, of course, of course, you need, and, you need uh, mode we just don't. You're basically exciting certain type of mode. Yes, of yes, course. Yes, yes, yes. And, and I think we have just not made that direct connection between quasi-normal modes and the dynamical response uh, at this stage. Uh, but it sounds interesting. I think that's, uh, that's something that can be uh, explored uh, in the future. But there's a pr principal difference of the black hole case with respect to the normal fluid uh, uh, star case is in this particular limit of uh, very slow tide where, you know, mm -hmm. in a normal star uh, to have a dis, I mean, you, you have both, you have both a distortion of the stars, you have a non-zero love number and you have a dissipation happening due to some sort of viscosity. 
Whereas in the case of the black hole, you can have zero love number and you still have uh, the dissipation uh, happening. Yes, in this. that's the that unusual. Is, that, that is, is the a unusual. unusual uh, uh, yes. thing compared yes. to the normal <laughs> Newtonian. Yes, yes. Uh, indeed, indeed, indeed. Ultimately, it traces back to this uh, this uh, unusual behav behavior of the event horizon, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ben has a question. Uh, hey thanks, Sanjang. Uh, awesome talk. And uh, I, was, I was wondering, given the, the recent uh, research in, in researchers in interest in this topic, has there been any more insight into why the left numbers of black holes are identically zero? Has there been any any progress in this respect, or is it still kind of a mystery? Well, I think I see Mikhail. Uh among uh, in the audience, uh, uh, Mikhail and uh, and collaborators recently have put out a paper that that um, explains that there's a hidden symmetry uh, associated to these vanishing of love numbers and is related to a symmetry of of the near horizon behavior of black. I don't know if Mikhail wants to jump in because I don't want to speak for uh, uh, speak Hi. for you and your collaborators. Yes, um, sure. Um, right, yeah. So it's been like a mystery why the sloth numbers vanish. But recently, we managed to find explicitly the symmetry that is responsible for it. For it. This is, in fact, the symmetry of, like, it's a so-called hidden symmetry. It's not an isometry of space-time. So it only acts on perturbations and only in the low-frequency limit. But, you know, for the static loft numbers, we're always in this low frequency limit such that for low numbers we get like exact results from it and using this symmetry yeah low numbers just vanish both for like Schwarzschild black holes and uh, the care black holes so yeah we recently put a paper on this and oh cool and that's great out. thanks Misha yeah of course for other yeah I should say that yeah it has to do like the symmetry has to do like the, the very presence of the symmetry is a result of having a horizon so for other things like usual fluid stars or uh, neutron stars, for them the symmetry doesn't hold, and we know that loft numbers are not zero, and they can be used, you know, to get some information about the equation of state of stuff like this. But for black holes, um, yeah, we have the horizon, and somehow we have this hidden symmetry. It's not clear what what's what's the origin of the symmetry, but I think that we also don't know what is the origin of the Runge-Lenz symmetry in the hydrogen, and as we know. Uh, yes. <laughs> like we're um, unfortunately didn't have time to discuss that the black hole is the is the atom it's the hydrogen atom of the 21st century and uh, like this low symmetry is the Rungelian symmetry it's an approximate symmetry that somehow appears in a low frequency limit that but no one knows what that what it means from the fundamental point of view yeah okay thanks so so some more time to dig deeper I think so yeah it's um, yeah Okay, great. If I may ask one more short question, uh, uh, what are the sure. prospects for extending these two charged black holes? I mean, there is a Schwarzschild case, uh, there is a spinning black hole. Now, what about charge? Would you expect a uh, lot of numbers to vanish there as well? I think so. So I think, uh, so just to advertise uh, Mikhail's work as well. So in addition to confirming that the love numbers, uh, it vanishes for a, for a gravitational perturbation, there they show that um, it would also vanish for a spin zero, a, a scalar or a vector uh, perturbation, a vector E and M perturbation specifically. Now, and these are all just different sort of responses to the black hole. And in those cases, the static responses vanishes identically. And the reason that that, that calculation is possible is because the, the Tchaikovsky equation does not only describe uh, spin two or gravitational perturbations, it also describes spin zero, spin one perturbations as well. So actually, I think you can trivially extend these calculations, uh, not just to other spin perturbations, but also to charge uh, black holes. And we know that the Tchaikovsky equation, there is a, a Tchaikovsky equation for charge and spinning black holes as well. And actually, I mean, we have not done these calculations, but I think it's almost, I don't know if Mikhail would agree, but I think it's almost a certainty that for a charged black hole, they would vanish as well. Um, I think it's, a, it's almost a certainty, I think. 
Yeah, I can just confirm that indeed recently I did this calculation for a charged black hole. Yeah, it, like yeah, yeah, it, the situation it is to... identical to the rotating black holes, in fact. So I guess mathematically it just means that you again get some logarithmic divergences at the horizon, and to just you know not have them in your solution, you have to kill certain terms. Is that uh, what's happening? So I think I think uh, mathematically what happens is that in addition to this p plus superradiance factor, which is only related to the spin of the black hole, there will be additional terms, uh, let's say q, which corresponds to charge superradiance in that case, something along those lines. But otherwise, the 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 technical aspects of the calculations are essentially identical. Right? Uh, Mikhail can probably uh, elaborate a little bit more on that, but I think that's essentially what sure. will happen. Yeah, the charged black holes are almost identical to the rotating black holes. Also, you have two horizons and things like this. So, cal like calculation wise, you have very similar equation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think what, that what happens if the huh? sorry, what happens if the charge gets too large and the horizon disappears? What happens in that? So the extremal case, you're saying? Yeah, the extremal case. Oh, this is actually very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting limit. Well, still the law of numbers they they be, they become zero, identically. Mm -hmm. In this case, but then this frequency dependent law of numbers that um, Hong Cheng was discussing and like derived for black holes, those ones will not be the end of the story. So, in fact, at the first order in frequency already, you will find some um, uh, like law of numbers. So, here at the leading order in frequency, we found that the law of numbers still zero, right? But for the extreme case, there will be non zero at the leading order in frequency. So, this is the um, twist. So non-zero and leading order in frequency in omega? Or... In, in, in omega, yes, in omega. Yeah, so in omega, you will find some, some non-static law. In the strict static limit, the law numbers will be zero still. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for small frequencies, you will, you will find some non-zero non law numbers. Right, right, uh, right. Yeah, which is kind of different from the non-extreme case that... Um, uh, like was presented before. Yeah. Okay, let's thank our speaker again for an excellent talk. And I am really looking forward to continuing this discussion and maybe hearing more about super radiance at 3 p.m. So please join us if you are interested and available. Thank you so much. <laughs>